it's a real thrill to see everybody here this evening. Um, can you all hear me at the back? Yes. Excellent. Um, so a huge welcome to everybody for the first roundtable discussion of the joint seminar of the uh, BSA and Greek Politics Specialist Group on Modern Greek Studies. And uh, the two key drivers of this um, are here with us. We have Lamborini Rory, um, who is second from the right, no, left, no, whatever, the <laughs> second from the end on that side, and Irini Karamuzui. And um, it's been brilliant um, getting to know them and their work and reading about all their work. And I just wish we had more days in the week to be able to have more of these kinds of discussions. Um, but just to, to introduce the two key coordinators very briefly, and then I'll hand over to Irini, who will introduce the rest of the panelists. So Lamparini, as I'm sure you all know, is Assistant Professor of Political Science and Public Administration in the University of Athens. And actually it's kind of, I mean, don't read her CV because you'll just think, oh my God, how did she do all of that? It's the same with you as well, Irene, both of you. I said this to Tanya earlier on, we, oh my God, such accomplished women we have. Um, uh, Lamborghini had uh, studied in various uni European universities. She then went on to have a postdoctoral fellowship at Oxford. She wasn't content with just doing that. And then she went on and had a Marie Curie fellowship. And I'm sure the icing on the cake was the BSA Early Career Fellowship, of course. And uh, Irini too had a BSA Early Career Fellowship too. So um, we're very happy with that. Um, Lamborghini held a lectureship in Exeter and now is back in Greece and in Athens. Um, Irini, uh, who's tonight's uh, coordinator, um, is between places and doing different things, um, but she is a senior lecturer in contemporary history in the University of Sheffield. And um, she also has held numerous prestigious fellowships from the A. Leventis Foundation, Max Weber as well. She's worked at Yale um, and she's written a huge number of articles and books, um, including uh, one that I'm actually very keen to have a look at, which is Greece, the EEC in the Cold War, 1974 to 9. Um, she was also, as I said, an early career fellow. And really, um, it's just left up to me now to welcome the other two panelists here in person and then our speakers online as well. Thank you all very much for joining us and thank you to, to the audience as well. And I'll pass over to Irini too. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this. And uh, we're very happy that the Greek School at Athens is kind of hosting us for a third year that we've been organizing with Ella Brini this uh, series on modern Greek studies. Uh, but when I say we, it's not the, just Ella Brini and I. Behind it, it's the Greek Politics Specialist Group. If you don't know them, they're an amazing uh, network, uh, international, that kind of uh, really supports research on Greece. It, helps, it holds scholarly events, but most importantly as well, acts like a hub between expert scholars and media do check it out and if you are interested in Greece you should sign up as a member now but today we gathered because uh, on the occasion of a publication of a special issue that was edited by Vasiliki Georgiadou and Labrini uh, in Journal of Modern Greek Studies on aspects of political violence in Greece I don't know is it open access should I go? you know no <laughs> but if you have an institutional affiliation you can see it and I'm sure that the editors will be happy to say uh, the output is a brilliant special issue that I think is quite timely um, I was uh, obliged in a way to do it because of this event but it's a great obligation to have uh, it, it tried it tries really to tackle uh, the different nature of political violence in Greece and trying to answer the question why is there such a persistence of this phenomenon in Greece and they take it from the metapolitics from 1974 and they take it up to today uh, and what they're acknowledging is because there's such a rich scholarly debate on the riches the nature of political violence who are the perpetrators, the identity of them, the ontology and typology of political violence, but also the victims themselves. So they are trying through this very extreme wide uh, spectrum uh, of theoretical uh, debates to kind of have their own say on where we stand now in terms of research on uh, Greek political violence, but also I think in what's equally important, 
where are we heading? So what are the unknowns, if there are any? Uh, we historians usually say that, what do we know now? Uh, but also, what, what, I mean, is there any forecast for future endeavors? Where should research be uh, focusing if you really want to explain this phenomena, not only in Greek terms, but also comparatively, uh, and have an impact as our UK universities are really striving us to have these days. Uh, so the way this panel was composed was to really um, echo the spirit of the special issue, which claims from uh, page one that is going to be interdisciplinary in its methodological and conceptual focus. And you have this comparative politics, history, philosophy, media. You get this completely broad spectrum uh, of uh, expertise and discipline. Uh, and all of them are trying to kind of uh, set out to explain exactly uh, how you can uh, discuss about political violence. And they do that by covering both ends of the ideological spectrum. So we're talking about both far left and far right across time, trying to get the complexity and not just focusing on one or the other. Um, so we have an amazing uh, group of panelists. I'm not going to delve into their CVs simply because they're well known. They're extremely research active, all of them, both online and here. But what all of them have in common, and I just realized it tonight, today when I was reading the special issue, is that they're all bold in actually expressing their opinion in public debate. They engage, they share this informed opinion by writing op-eds in Greek newspapers, global media outlets. So they are the, the best people to share their expertise, but in a way that is simplified so people can really understand where we stand on this aspect of political violence. So a little bit of housekeeping. We are a truly hybrid event. There's audience here in the room. There's audience online. We have, I think, 43 participants, which is fantastic. Two of our speakers are online, three of them are in the house. Something will probably go wrong. So bear with us. We've tried our best to accommodate all audiences. So each speaker has been allotted 10 minutes, so you know. They will try to talk about this aspect from their own expertise. We didn't send a specific set of questions on purpose, so we try to widen the debate. Uh, they've been given 10 minutes, and then I will not abuse my uh, position as chair, only if you force me to, if you have no questions. And then I will open it up for Q&A for around uh, the rest of the half hour that is left. So hopefully that is clear. Also, people that are online, if you want to ask questions, please type on the chat function that's at the bottom of the Zoom link. I will try to read them all, filter them, and pose the questions to the participants. You cannot pose a question if you're online. Here, you're allowed to do it. Um, OK, so very quickly, I'm going to introduce my speakers. Really, I'm not going to delve into their CVs. They're absolutely. Um, I mean, unnerving uh, from someone who's reading them. So the first one to go uh, and will be online is Stathis Kalivas. He's a Gladstone professor of government at Oxford University and a fellow at All Souls College. Um, I won't talk about his versatile research interests, but he's stealing the thunder of historians. I'll just say that. The second is Nikola Sevastakis. He's a professor and he teaches political and social philosophy at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Then we have Professor Vasiliki Georgiadu, who is a professor of political scientists at Padian University and holds like a bazillion research grants uh, on several issues on uh, xenophobia, trust, and many others. Then my partner in crime, Labrini Rori, who has been introduced, uh, but has written extensively on the topic. And last but not least, uh, Romanos Gerodimos, who is a professor of current global affairs at Bournemouth University, also is extremely versatile. He films, he directs, he researches everything. And I just discovered that he just published a book on interdisciplinarity applications of shame, violence theory, and breaking the cycle. It sounds really interesting. Congratulations on that. OK, that's it. The, the floor goes to uh, staff is first. We thank you so much for accepting our invitation and hope to have a fruitful discussion. Staff is the, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, if you cannot, just let me know. Um, um, I'm speaking to. Okay, I'm speaking to uh, to a screen. I cannot see you, but um, I'm going to try to say um, a couple of things about uh, the paper I wrote for this um, uh, edited uh, journal issue. Uh, I'm very grateful, actually, to uh, the editors because I, I wanted to to write this paper for quite a long time. Uh, and that uh, special journal issue gave me the opportunity to do so. Uh, it combines um, two types of interest. One is theoretical, the other one is uh, substantive. And underlying that, there is uh, also a 
an interesting methodological dimension to it. So on the theoretical side, the paper uh, addressed the question of radicalization. Uh, very simply put, uh, there is quite a lot of research on uh, how people radicalize. Uh, it is not the kind of research that I like very much. It's very much associated with um, uh, Islamist uh, terrorism uh, and, and therefore um, lacks this sort of coverage. Um, is there any problem? We're just trying to get you up on the screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, therefore, lacks the kind of coverage that the topic uh, deserves, radicalization. Uh, is a process uh, that um, does not necessarily uh, remain. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, are you? Um, am I still with you? Yeah. Okay. Should I keep talking, uh, irrespective of what happens on my screen? Or uh... yes, please. Okay. Very good. Uh, radicalization is not wedded to a particular ideology. Uh, it's a process that leads people to adopt ideas, positions, perceptions that demarcate them from uh, whatever happens to be the mainstream. Uh, today's um, radical ideas may be tomorrow's uh, mainstream uh, and vice versa. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to disaggregate the process and open it up and apply it uh, in, on the Greek case, disaggregating it into three um, steps. One is the process of radicalization. The second one is the process of uh, selecting a type of action that is clandestine, going underground, uh, in other words. And the third one, adopting uh, violent practices. And my point is that very often the term radicalization, as used in the literature, assumes that those three things go together. And in fact, uh, they are not. Uh, moving on to the substantive side, um, I decided to focus on four uh, Greeks, um, all um, alive, who um, uh, in one way or another um, uh, adopted uh, this uh, pathway of radicalization in a different kind of uh, combination, a different kind of form. In a sense, I decided to focus uh, on pathways, on individual trajectories, uh, where um, the process uh, as disaggregated uh, did not necessarily contain the same elements. Uh, for example, one of them radicalized and became clandestine without adopting violent action uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'll say more about them. The third um, dimension of the paper is methodological in the sense that I, I was curious to see how far we could go by using uh, a, a source that is not very often used in political science. Uh, and this is the uh, memoir or um, autobiography. Uh, and I was uh, led to that by the fact that there were four uh, important uh, autobiographies that were published in Greece uh, by four people who described their experience uh, in ways that are, um, I would argue, highly detailed uh, and constitute a group um, that on the surface doesn't share a lot in common, but in practice uh, can be compared, uh, I think, in a, in a quite um, a fruitful way. Uh, who are they and, and what are their, their books? Uh, uh, I'll mention them uh, immediately. The first author uh, is the well-known writer Apostolos Doxiadis, uh, and the biography that I uh, analyzed um, is entitled um, in Greek, Erasitechnis Epanastatis Prosopiki Mythistoria, uh, my translation, Amateur Revolutionary, a Personal Myth History. Uh, the second one uh, is Dimitris Kufodinas, uh, the leader of uh, the group uh, 17th of November. Um, the book is entitled uh, Yenithika uh, the Kaeftan Noembri. I was born on 17th of November and, and was published um, a few years um, ago. It's the uh, earlier of, all, of these four books. The third book um, uh, is a biography, an autobiography of Nikos Giannopoulos, who is a, uh, a left-wing activist um, and a street fighter, as I characterize him. Uh, his book um, is entitled uh, Ole Filalako, Mia Historia Geto Kinima, Ti Zoeri Akra Eristera Getos Anthropoustis. I translated that a bit liberally, but uh, that was the only way to do it. Oh boy, a history of the movement, the bouillon far left and its people. And lastly, the four book um, uh, was authored by um, a bank robber and kidnapper, uh, Vasilis Paleokostas, 
Uh, the title is Μια Φυσιολογική Ζωή, Δράσεις και Αποδράσεις Ενός Επικηρυγμένου, uh, Translation and Normal Life and Outlaws, Escapades and Escapes uh, in my translation. These are four very different people, but they all share uh, a process that led them to adopt uh, ideas uh, and, and in some cases practices uh, that move them away from the mainstream, although in a different combination. Uh, Apostolos Doxiadis uh, is uh, a person who becomes radicalized during uh, the Greek dictatorship, the colonial regime uh, in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, uh, but uh, uh, decides to go underground, um, acts clandestinely during um, the last uh, few years of the dictatorship in a variety of activities, but never adopts Uh, violent practices. In fact, he rejects them uh, emphatically. After the end of the dictatorship, uh, he de-radicalizes, he becomes mainstream, and I argue that his story is perhaps the most representative uh, of many uh, Greek uh, youth during that time who became radicalized um, uh, because of the, uh, their, their experiences of the dictatorship and de-radicalized after the dictatorship was over uh, in the sense that uh, they uh, did not go underground, became uh, active in a variety of uh, uh, conventional uh, political parties, uh, in a sense spanning the entire uh, range uh, uh, of the spectrum. We still describe these people as uh, the generation of the polytechnic because they are very closely associated with uh, uh, the uh, insurrection of the Polytechnic School in Athens in 1973. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the book presents uh, an overview of his various uh, choices, dilemmas, and so on. Uh, the second person, uh, Dimitris Kufodinas, who is serving, still serving a life sentence uh, in a Greek prison for his um, activity in the context of the terrorist uh, group uh, 17th of November, Uh, also wrote a, a very um, uh, well-known um, autobiography where he describes uh, his choices and, and dilemmas. He also became radicalized uh, very much uh, like Luxiadis around, um, uh, later on he was younger, but around the uh, polytechnic insurrection as well. Uh, uh, was active in a variety of uh, radical politics immediately after uh, the collapse of the dictatorship and the transition democracy. Uh, and then became active uh, in underground activities and violent activities. Uh, he uh, uh, has been, uh, in a sense, tried, uh, has been tried and convicted of uh, various assassinations. Um, and therefore, um, even though he begins in the same uh, trajectory like Luxiadis, he follows a very different path. Uh, in fact, the end of the dictatorship and the transition of democracy mark uh, the complete opposite trajectories and exemplify. Uh, two very different pathways. The mainstream, the more conventional one, exemplified by Doxiadis, the much less common, yet one that the literature has associated with the so-called fringe uh, developments in radical politics, when people who become disappointed uh, with um, uh, peaceful radical activities uh, become uh, and join violent movements. The third person uh, is someone in between the two previous ones. Nikos Giannopoulos is not uh, broadly known, but is extremely well known uh, within the far left in Greece. He's uh, uh, the person who is most uh, associated with um, street action, demonstrations, riots, uh, what have you. He's been present in all those activities uh, after 1974, also radicalizes as a younger uh, boy, Uh, in the Polytechnic Uprising, becomes very active in all these causes um, after the transition democracy, uh, participates in various street actions that entail vandalism, um, at fighting against the police, and at some point even considers, and, and he uh, mentions that in his book, uh, undertaking um, a clandestine action. Uh, he gets uh, training uh, uh, in a Palestinian camp, but decides, as he claims, not to Uh, against that, uh, is very close to Kufodinas. In fact, he's the person who uh, edited and prefaces Kufodinas' memoir. And his own book is prefaced by uh, a well-known um, uh, leftist journalist uh, in Greece. Uh, he uh, interacts with a lot of uh, well-known politicians of the left, uh, especially the component uh, of Syriza that comes from um, the old Sinaspismos parties, the left wing of that party. 
At some point, he becomes a member uh, of Syriza himself, uh, uh, and and he quits before Syriza becomes comes to, to the government. Uh, he's is as a lot of the reviews pointed out of his book, um, a living memory of that um, uh, more activist um, aspect uh, of the Greek left, and, and he's very much liked uh, by those people. And finally, the fourth person. Um, is Vasilis Paleokostas, who you would think wouldn't fit uh, with the other three because he doesn't actually radicalize in the sense of becoming a political radical first. Uh, he's a criminal uh, by any meaning in any sense. Uh, he's uh, very famous and very active in a variety of uh, daring uh, and spectacular um, uh, criminal activities, uh, especially bank robberies uh, and kidnappings. He also escapes uh, twice from prison and he's still at large. Um, he hasn't been uh, captured after his second uh, jailbreak from the Corrida Los prison. Uh, however, uh, he acquires a sort of radical um, profile uh, during uh, the time he spends in prison, probably uh, out of uh, a process of osmosis uh, and uh, interaction with other um, uh, radical uh, leftists who serve sentences uh, in the same prison where he uh, serves uh, as well. He describes this process uh, quite eloquently, uh, and he also develops a, a very strong, uh, in his book, uh, a very strong discourse uh, that has a, an anti-authoritarian, uh, prim primordially leftist, uh, and extremely um, anti-police uh, dimension. Uh, in that respect, I would say Paleocostas and Yiannopoulos share um, uh, a profile that, that is very much uh, characterized by opposition to the police uh, uh, and a sort of personal, uh, almost vendetta, as uh, we can characterize it, um, dimension in their activities. Uh, and of course, he's, he's a violent actor. So he's both clandestine, violent, but much less radicalized than the previous three. So I think these four biographies uh, give us um, a very interesting uh, um, set of characteristics that allow us to reflect uh, on radicalization and its various dimensions, uh, but they also allow us to reflect uh, on a certain um, relation between a clandestine radical violent action on the one hand uh, and the legacies of the left on the other hand. The point I made in my paper uh, is that even though Apostolos Doxiadis represents the more uh, typical pathway, uh, he's the least popular among the uh, today's uh, today's left. Uh, he has actually he's not describing himself he, himself as a leftist anymore, uh, but he's not uh, his his pathway is not um, characterized as as as, as something that, that that is worth uh, representing an example of sorts. Uh, whereas the other three characters, all very different from each other. Uh, are very much um, celebrated uh, as heroic and, and in a sense fulfilled a sort of agonistic paradigm that has uh, remained extremely, um, I would say, uh, present within the left. Uh, even though Kufodinas uh, is a, a convicted terrorist, uh, he uh, enjoys uh, uh, a lot of um, positive press uh, within a segment of the far left. Uh, you probably remember uh, the mobilization uh, of thousands of uh, activists um, uh, a couple of years ago in the, in the core of the pandemic uh, in favor uh, and in support of uh, a, a, a hunger strike he undertook in prison. Uh, he, uh, in excerpts from his uh, autobiography were published um, uh, in, uh, I think, Eleftherotypia when uh, the book came out. Uh, Yiannopoulos is, is celebrated among the left uh, as representing the um, agonistic um, character um, that the left uh, wants to um, emphasize. And Paleocostas uh, as well, uh, even though he's uh, a common criminal uh, who's, and potentially someone whose radical profile is perhaps opportunistic, uh, has also been celebrated very much. Uh, excerpts uh, of his uh, biography, autobiography, were published in, um, I think, Ephemerida to Sidacton uh, before uh, the publication of his book. And it's, his book is actually, uh, uh, compared to the other three, the one that sold the most copies, the most popular one uh, among the public. Uh, so here we have, I think, a, a very interesting um, theoretical 
and, uh, and substantive uh, set of uh, trajectories, a lot of uh, very insightful points, uh, an unusual comparison, uh, which uh, I was very happy to be able to do, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Vasilikis and Labrini's prodding. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we can uh, discuss those issues um, and you can read the paper uh, and let me know what you thought of it. Thank you so much, uh, Nicolas. I think you're next, uh, if you can hear us. Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. Is it possible to turn on your camera? Do. Can you turn on your camera? Do you have that possibility to do that? Uh, no. Okay, I'm so, well, we can hear okay. you. Come, go on. It's, it's okay. It's because they're not uh, and they're finalists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here with friends and colleagues talking about a difficult issue that has been with us here in Greece uh, for decades. Uh, I follow some path of, from Stathis Kalivas, uh, the significance of individual trajectories and the different modalities of radical faith and action. Uh, I confess also that the first generation Greek terrorist or extremist was after all the central character of my novel uh, with the title Man in the Shadow. And this title, I assume it makes some sense for our discussion. Uh, I would like to make a few thoughts on leftist political violence after uh, 1974, a year that was a turning point in our recent political history, of course. Well, armed struggle or a kind of urban guerrilla was a fringe idea that during the dictatorship attracted the preference of some leftists as well as people from the political center or even the royalist right. Uh, the path towards terrorism is a complicated combination of individual choices, conspirational practices and networks created mostly in the last two years of the dictatorship and in the first year of metapolitefsy. Uh, <clears throat> Something happened with my. We can hear you though. Uh, yes, yes. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> um, excessive repression after the Athens Polytechnic. Uh, student uprising, as well as the coming of people from the revolutionary and resistance organization of Western Europe, already in contact with radical ideas and milieus. In the summer of 1974, we play an important role. Without the dictatorship and violent repression, torture and corresponding traumatic experiences, the creation, I think, of permanent armed force would probably be impossible. Immediately afterwards, discrete contacts of armed militants with elements of the new labor and social movement of factory workers was also remarkable for the creation of the field. But when the first uh, 17th November assassination will take place, the space of armed organization was closed and barriers and different high levels of secrecy were created. Uh, the field of left political violence after uh, 1974 was expressed mostly in a language originating in the history of Greek communist movement. The style of analysis, vocabulary, goals, and public sentiments that accompanied this violence are part of a long tradition that goes back to the 40s and 30s. Of course, the new urban practice is dissenting and in a distance from the established codes of the old left politics, the legal organization and parties of the left. However, without the common and powerful civil war mythology as a just popular war, and without the experience of the seven year dictatorship, it would be very difficult, the creation of armed organization and the legitimation of radical and violent practices. There is, of course, a question, and 
important question, whether Greek terrorism was the domest domestic expression of a European phenomenon, an aberration of loud and flamboyant leftism, or whether its roots were internal experiences and in particular a know-how of illegality and clandestine action and the culture of state and police repression that intermittently marked the period after the Second World War. I, I tend to answer mainly the later, although it is almost certain that many of the founding members of the Greek extremist scene also lived abroad in Paris, Brussels, Munich, or other parts of Western Europe. On the contrary, uh, I make a parenthesis here, on the contrary, for historical reasons, and not only far-right political violence could not last, despite a belief quite popular on the left, governments have not tolerated the far-right violent activism and especially conservative governments. Any far-right terrorist attempt, especially by colonel sympathizers and neo-Nazi fanatics, were quickly disbanded and during their trials, this is the important, these people, they had no sympathies and campaigns of support from the part of the conventional political right. Uh, the metapolitical cycle has been characterized by the hegemony of anti-fascist and anti-American, anti-Western ideas and sentiments. But this is not a specific leftist phenomenon. In the early years, until almost 1978, people from almost the whole spectrum, from the center to the far left, borrows forms of explanation of social reality and patterns of political hostility that will appear also in the proclamations of uh, November 17th organization. In terms of ideas and many of its goals, November 17th was an art banality, the lethal expression of many private conversations among ordinary petit bourgeois peaceful Greeks. In a sense, the dominant version of the most brutal political violence in the country, reproduce widespread ideological narratives of the era, like the center-periphery divide, certain dependency theories, an old version of the idea of Greek parasitic capitalism or of the lumpen nature of Greek upper class. These were descriptions and the style of thought widely circulated in Greek political and mainstream cultural descriptions of this period. If you read any story, about the role of the Americans and the CIA in mainstream publication that even belong to the political center, uh, the proclamation of terrorists uh, or other riser will appear as trivial variation and somehow more tough versions of a very ordinary discourse. Greek armed violence, left terrorism, lasted many years for another reason. And we can say that after 20 years, People who knew apparently more about the founding and the first at least steps of art violence did not want to mobilize and somehow react against this phenomenon. To say at least not in my name, to distance openly and publicly themselves from solidarity campaigns or from the usual position of the defense witness, always asserting that these arrests are plots by the state and the police against innocent idealists and activists. If prominent people from the progressive side, including some respected institutional figures, had seen left-wing terrorism as a total deviance and an openly authoritarian and democratic way, I think the phenomenon would have lessened and shrunk as early as the 80s before it had developed its worst phases. Uh, this attitude is maybe understandable in the first post-dictatorial years but unacceptable and inexcusable from the 80s onwards. I also believe that the moral and perhaps more than moral responsibility of certain people of Greek politics and culture is something that has not been discussed also openly as much as it deserves. This attitude, assuming there are no other motives behind it, is related to the legacy of an anti-fascism and the resistant morality that in our country was not complemented by a clear anti-totalitarian democratic stance. Until recently, the silence of people in the progressive center left and left has contributed uh, to the permanent banalization of political violence. 
or a kind of cynical underestimation of this particular event. Uh, I will also note that for the same reasons, I think, or because of fear, unacceptable as such in a democracy, social scientist research about this topic was delayed and for years there has not been a serious and bold journalistic investigation. I mean a formal investigation that does not simply convey allegations, scenarios and leaks from the authorities or party official, or political party officials. On the contrary, there were confusion and lack of focus. Articles and reports that spoke either of improbable hidden leaders at the top of the state or that there were no left-wing terrorists, but only extreme right-wingers and secret agents uh, of the secret services. A close review of the press and other open sources uh, shows that there was a sort of noise around every terrorist act. I mean a rather chaotic and chatty handling of every incident. Noise and chatter seemed like sincere and real concern, but all this did not bring with it either a serious movement condemning political violence or a desire to truly awaken the people for the delegitimation of extremist culture. Uh, I think on the broader cultural and political left, despite rhetorical condemnation and ritualistic theoretical comments against useless individual terrorism and so on, there was always an idea of a large family, an idea of a moral oppositional community. Within the construction of this moral community of anti-systemic voices and anti-establishment moods, found shelter, and those who burned buildings, killed people, or stood to intervene in political process as armed minorities at the expense of democracy and our common life. This is the uh, Rosanna Rosa, let's say, the um, family album of the left. Uh, and it's a problem that this discussion has not opened yet. Thank you very much. If you can scotch there so I think your line people can see a face. <laughs> so thank you, Rini. Thank you very much for uh, your hospitality. Um, as uh, Irini said in um, uh, here in in the introductory remarks, uh, we have guest edited together with Lamrini a special section in uh, the Journal of Modern Greek Studies um, that is dedicated on political violence in Greece. Um, Nicolas said a few minutes uh, um, ago that um, it is a very, a very difficult uh, issue, actually. Um, so uh, we are grateful uh, to the editors Antonis Elinas and Johanna Hanning for this opportunity uh, to uh, uh, guest edit a special section uh, in a so uh, difficult topic, which is political violence, especially in Greece. Um, the section includes uh, four articles. Um, one of them is uh, uh, the article of uh, Stasis Kalivas, and uh, he has uh, already explained uh, about um, uh, the content, uh, and we were also impressed uh, um, that he has um, uh, explained um, um, the different um, uh, pathways of radicalization, and he has uh, distinguished uh, um, radicalization from violence, uh, these are not uh, um, um, identical actually as phenomena, I mean, uh, as Stathis um, um, pointed out, uh, radicalization um, has, uh, um, um, could be expressed uh, through uh, clandestinity, uh, through moderate, uh, uh, pathways, etc., but also um, um, violence and, and open violence could be 
an alternative uh, of uh, um, a radicalized pathway. A second article is written by uh, Maria Pontiki, Nikos Saridakis, Dimitris Gumas, and Maria Gavilidou, and um, uh, examines um, uh, verbal aggression on the Greek Twitter. And the authors find out that uh, uh, although new democracy was mostly attacked uh, um, before and after the 2019 parliamentary elections, Syriza was the recipient of the most offensive attacks. I think this is an important finding. Uh, a third article is written by uh, Mike Phillips and Anders Yuktas. Um, both authors analyze far-right violence. They focus only on far-right violence in Greece, but in a comparative uh, perspective. And um, an interesting, although alarming finding um, is that uh, severe far-right violence in Greece is higher than in many other uh, European uh, countries uh, between 2016 and 2020 a fact that might uh, relate to the organized nature of the perpetrators in Greece. Uh, this is not the case in other European countries uh, where the perpetrators uh, are not organized. And um, perhaps th this might relate uh, to the offensiveness uh, and the, the violent character of Golden Dawn that dominates during that period. And the fourth paper is written by Lamprini, Costas Romanias, and me, and analyzes uh, political violence in Greece from 2008 to 2019. Uh, so we focus on uh, the second generation of political violence, Nikola Sevastakis mostly uh, focused on the first generation of political violence in Greece. And we covered both ideological uh, faces of political violence based uh, on a new data set uh, that uh, scrutinizes the phenomenon uh, from new uh, perspectives and angles. Um, let me uh, say a few words uh, um, about uh, the concept, about uh, the theory, the theoretical part of, uh, of uh, our work. Um, we rely um, a lot on Stathis Kaliva's uh, conceptualization of political violence. And uh, Stathis um, uh, wrote in many papers uh, that uh, political violence is a very broad and uh, actually ill-defined term. And uh, we try to, uh, to, uh, to define our own working definition on political violence, uh, writing uh, this, uh, this paper and editing this volume. So we focused on uh, non-state uh, violent actions uh, that challenge the state's monopoly of violence and the authority of elected officials and incumbents in setting and implementing political goals. Uh, this is our working definition. Uh, the fact that we do not concentrate on other aspects of political violence does not mean that we ignore these other aspects. Um, for instance, that um, uh, state, uh, the state and states uh, um, exercise violence as well, legitimize and illegitimize. There are structural aspects of violence, uh, institu institutionalized uh, violence, etc. So there are other aspects of political violence although we focus only on um, what I said, the non-state violent actions. Um, political violence, a part of um, being ill-defined, uh, is also a fluid ph phenomenon in, this, in the sense that 
non-violent actions may escalate into violent conflicts and vice versa, violent actors may strategically follow non-violent means or low violent means in order to be more influential. Uh, the Greek December of 2008 initiated a new cycle of uh, unrest and gave rise to this fluidity. Since then, Greece has experienced a new cycle of violence with political connotations on which we focus uh, in our research and in this paper, in this special section, uh, presenting also a new database on political violence from 2008 to 2019. I would like uh, to add two remarks, one on methodology we have implemented and another one on um, the analytical part of our contribution. First on methodology. Given that uh, no systematic official data on political motivated uh, non-state violence exists, uh, at least for the time period we are interested in, from 2008 to 2019, we extract data mainly from media sources and from other digital sources, employing event analysis, which is a key method in uh, international conflicts uh, and protest movement studies as well. Our unit of analysis is the violent attack. Uh, we identified violent attacks having used a list of keywords and phrases related to political violence with which we search for violent attacks in our data sources, media and uh, digital, Google. Um, each violent attack was coded for specific attributes and registered irrespective of the ideological orientation of the actors or the nature of attacks. After we have collected the violent attacks and classified them according to various parameters and attributes, Incidents when then uh, categorized to a far right or a far left orientation. Um, this does not mean that there are no differences between far right and far left um, in uh, uh, concerning political violence, of course. It, uh, it only means that we are interested in the whole spectrum of political violence and use the same parameters for recognizing attacks uh, from our sources. Um, so we implement um, um, the same uh, methodology and uh, taxonomy in order to classify, to find out and to classify um, the violent attacks and then to categorize um, in far left and far right violent attacks. Um, and the last point concerning uh, an, our analytical contribution, uh, political violence, as we know, and uh, Nicola Sevastakis um, uh, has uh, explained in her speech, uh, in his speech, what I'm, uh, I would like to say, Political violence did not die out after the return to democracy and did not disappear after the arrest and dissolution of November 17. However, despite this persistency of political violence, um, it is not a linear phenomenon. There are fluctuations and waves or cycles of violence, of political violence. In our research, we focus on the last wave of political violence that was accelerated after December 2008, um, in the midst of uh, financial crisis and in the peak of uh, the refugee flows in Greece. Uh, this is a context that um, intensified polarization, as we all know, and political destabilization 
which created on the other side opportunities for the acceptance, the toleration, or even the use of uh, violence, of political violence. So persistency and non-linearity are aspects of political violence and the challenge for us and for uh, scholars that focus on this phenomenon is to find out uh, the effects that uh, either cultivate this persistency or undermine um, and restrict this persistency. Um, for example, which framing issues or policy increase or decrease political violence. This is something uh, I think important. Uh, and the special section we have co-edited and uh, the, the, the paper uh, we have uh, co-authored with Lambrini and Costas. Um, the other papers in this section as well um, I would say our research on political violence uh, might give um, some responses to this question. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in my turn, I would like to thank the British School and Rebecca for this third year of cooperation with the Greek Politics Specialist Group. I'm very happy to participate in this roundtable discussion with the distinguished colleagues specializing on political violence. So my research in this field and our research started back in 2011 with a collaborative project on right-wing extremism in the city of Athens. And since then it expands towards different directions, including the left wing edge of political violence. And we all the more use more methods in order to try to understand the phenomenon. So with the financial aid of NLSE grant that we were awarded by the Hellenic Observatory, initially with Vasiliki Georgiadou, and then joined in our team by Kostas Rumanias, we constructed a data set on political violence by the use of media sources. Uh, I will now present some of the findings of this research since um, Vasiliki has uh, introduced uh, the method and uh, the concept uh, that we have um, um, used in order to construct the data set. So we uh, examine political violence in this very turbulent context that started with the riots of December 2008 and aggravated uh, with the financial crisis until 2019. December 2008 is a very, very important uh, um, uh, moment in this uh, a period of uh, uh, study because it's not just another a trigger event, it, it's a real catalyst which radicalized a substantial number of young people and thus contributed to the construction of a second generation of political violence in Greece since the transition to democracy. We end our research in 2019 because with the exit from the bailout agreements and the governmental change, it marks the end of this very difficult, traumatic period for the Greek society and uh, the economy. For this, um, we created the data set which comprises 2,429 violent events, uh, of which 1,925 stem from uh, the far uh, left and 504 stem from the far right. So although there are significant disparities between uh, the political extremes, our research shows that the political violence is certainly a two-sided phenomenon. We identified differences between the far right and far left violence in terms of both frequency and variability and in terms of how political violence is to be explained. We found that far left violence occurs almost four times more frequently than far right violence. Far right violence uh, seems to be more evenly spread across the country. It is less variable over time and it is more consistent in terms of frequency and intensity. 
On the other hand, far left violence seems to be more prone to external and random stimuli. It is uh, uh, being grounded in pre-existing practices and uh, a culture of sympathy for acts of anti-state resistance, anti-systemic behavior, violent confrontations and protests that have been institutionalized since the mid seventies. Thans uh, far left violence is less consistent and it presents greater variability both in time and space. It is mainly an urban phenomenon. It flares up in densely populated uh, areas at times of tension. Far right violence by contrast is neither urban nor uh, rural only and it does not fluctuate to the same degree as far left violence. It exhibits greater consistency over space and over time. Now the organized component of political violence seems to be similar for the two ideological uh, sides in the way that it evolves at least from 2010 until 2017. Uh, but a much greater proportion of far left violence consists of uh, anarchist uh, attacks, which show little consistency in time and which seem spontaneous, even if they might conceal a more rigid organizational frame. Far left and far right acts of violence also differ with respect to the targets. Far left perpetrators prefer material targets, whereas far right perpetrators prefer human ones. Also far left actors commit more incidents of low intensity, whereas far right actors uh, more incidents of high intensity. Now, even though Greece has experienced the most severe and longest uh, lasting effects of the recent uh, Great Re Repression, far left violence does not seem to be correlated with those extraordinary conditions that the country has faced. So all those uh, 20 years in which uh, the country suffered uh, severe shocks, financial, economic, socio-cultural, and political, far left, far left the violence uh, display, displayed variability, but was seemingly uh, unaffected by this uh, hardship. And we found that where there were other conditions, mainly um, linked to organizational uh, factors that triggered political violence. The lack of responsible or responsiveness of far left violence to grievances and political opportunities showed that far left violence is instead determined by its own rationales and ideological grounds. So, um, because I don't want to, uh, uh, to say all that I had in mind because I want uh, Romanos to uh, have some time for uh, his presentation. I just want to say that um, whereas far right violence is based on the belief that the national way of life and national sovereignty are under threat, far left violence is mostly motivated by a variety of ideological uh, frames supporting an agenda of radical, reactionary, and identity politics. I hope to have uh, more time in the Q&A to say a few things that uh, I had initially in mind. So, Romanos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becca, for welcoming us in this uh, beautiful space. And thank you, Labrini and Irini, for this invite and the Greek Politics Specialist Group as well. Um, the first thing to say is that this special issue is really wonderful. I really enjoyed reading every every paper and um, it, it really makes, it's what I call a legacy project. It really provides us with um, databases and data and methodological and conceptual and empirical contributions that I think a lot of people will be using in the future. Um, we've, we haven't seen this kind of systematic, rigorous, interdisciplinary um, effort uh, at that extent, I think, before. So I think it is quite unprecedented. Um, the amount of data in it, not just kind of like raw data, but, uh, but um, really systematically, transparently collected and laid out is 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 wonderful. Uh, the first thing I, I'm going to be really brief because I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so I've only have like six very quick uh, observations or provocations. Uh, the first one is that what this does, what their data does, is 
um, identify fluctuation over time. So political violence is not a constant. It's not, you know, we tend to say, oh, you know, there's political violence. Um, it's not kind of like a sort of a, a, a flat line across time, it changes. And I think that is really important because for many reasons, but obviously change over time means that there, is, there are causal relationships <laughs> at play. So there's cause and effect. So it helps us understand what is going on, what is, what is contributing to violence. So I think it's important to look at um, when is it changing? I have to say, actually, I was surprised by by um, that study that that, that Lamborghini just presented. Because, for example, uh, experientially or from my observations, I would have thought that um, broadly speaking, from two thousand and eight, which which everybody has rightly said is was really a key moment in Greece, we had that first period of really seminal moments of violence until twenty thirteen. It was uh, the outbreak of the Greek crisis. There was a like there was a lot of protests in, in downtown Athens. Uh, there was a golden dawn, of course, but there were also famous uh, cases of arson and so on. And then you had a period where golden dawn is being contained and then um, and we're, we're heading towards normality a little bit, the crisis is being normalized. So you have a middle period where there's a little bit less violence. And I would have said that the third period when Syriza gets elected and it acts as like a pressure valve that takes uh, the pressure off the political system since then that we've had like the least violence, but actually if you look at their their graph, uh, which is sort of here, you'll see that actually that far left violence, especially like shoots up after 2017, which I thought, you know, wow, I didn't really see that coming. And, 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 and it's good to be surprised by these kinds of studies because it reminds us it's kind of like a, you know it's 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 sort of humbling, but it, because it means that you, your analysis has to be grounded in data. But also, you know, if for some reason you think that this there's something not wrong, but like there's another way to interpret this, then you it, it helps you be transparent about um, interrogating those findings. So I think that's really really important. Uh, the first thing, uh, the second thing I would, I would I would say is the biggest takeaway for me is really the quite um, clear now. Well, fact that there the fact far left violence in Greece is real, um, and it's been real for a very long time, and it's massive. and And I want to juxtapose that to the astounding silence that there's been in the literature um, back ten years ago, when some of us were talking about the theory, you know, some so-called and much more aligned theory of the two extremes. Uh, we, that was a taboo on social media. If you said that there were like two extremes in Greece, you were like immediately in the territory of character assassination and being completely canceled, as we would say today. Um, so having this kind of like data, which shows that viral violence is, uh, I'm not qualitatively judging, there's no good kind of violence, no bad, but it, but it exists, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, and the problem with, 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 with not talking about it is that what you're doing is you're legitimizing uh, it, by being one-sided, you are allowing the other side to feel to develop a culture of grievance and victimhood that then legitimizes their violence and whatever they do then um, is considered to be okay. Um, so I think that's also important. Third thing I'm gonna say is that, um, and this is where I diverge a little bit from the special issue in my interpretation. Um, we also need to look at psychological and psychosocial root causes of violence. So political violence is violence. Of course, there are specific characteristics of political violence. Um, but we, I think very rightly, uh, Stathis and others have said that we need to broaden the definition of political violence, and I would argue that we need to broaden it even more. So domestic violence or gender-based violence has political or or political in intersects with political and social aspects. Or even, you know, when hooligans trash the metro every weekend, which I, like I've been around for a couple of months now, and it happens every weekend in front of my eyes, that is not necessarily political violence, but actually it is because it reveals something about power relations in this country and in public space and how certain groups appropriate space and how they consider, how they see themselves and their role. And I'm talking now about, for example, football football clubs or their 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 fans and so on, and how that gets then entangled with media ownership. Um, so of course, you know, if you follow that logic, then trashing the metro by if you football hooligans could be legitimately considered to be political violence. So, um, so we need to, we also need to think about um, those other spaces. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the special issue doesn't do that. I'm saying we also need to, in terms of looking forward, we need to take this work and build on it, looking 
at, at that aspect. Um, th there is a tendency to focus on resources and opportunities um, in, in political violence, which is right, but to, to use sort of Agatha Christie in terms of means, motive, and or other motive, means, and opportunity, I think we also need to look more deeply into motive. Um, and what I mean by that is we need to look at um, violence, not just uh, in a vacuum, but within an affective ecosystem. So within an ecosystem of emotions. So violence is not um, something that happens separately. It's it's related to anger or fear or resentment or any other kind of palette of emotions um, are how we are brought up, our relationships in the family. Um, all those things that may never actually manifest themselves in what you classify through our data as violence, but actually the root causes are the same. And, and, and Irina kindly mentioned the book we did on shame. And I personally think without wanting to be sound monocausal that, that shame is has a really big part of that. So we also need um, to bring in cultural anthropology and, and other disciplines to, to inform that. And then my fifth, fifth and ultimate thing is uh, about the comparative dimension. And then again, there's re some really useful data in, in, in this uh, book about this. Um, it, one might be tempted to think that Greece is somehow like a, an exceptional um, sort of country where there, there's a lot of violence, but um, that is not true. Um, it's interesting to see how different um, how different countries go through different cycles of crises, and and if you look, if you compare, I'm just going to take the example of the UK because I'm quite sort of I, I I live there, so I know that quite well. So since Brexit, for example, or since before the referendum, you had um, two MPs being assassinated, Joe Cox and Sir David Amos, and very public. I mean, that's pretty. I mean, no human life is greater than any other human life, but symbolically, these events were massive, and you had um, extraordinary abuse against MPs, female MPs, MPs from um, from ethnic minorities uh, on Twitter or, or actually in the street every day. And that's, and that's just like a tiny um, element of, of the level of violence that has been got going on in the UK. And what I mean by that is that um, there, are different, there are different manifestations of violence in, in each country. So um, Greece, definitely has a problem with far-right violence and I think that's well documented. But um, again, you know, where do you draw the lines between, for example, far left or Islamist extremism or any other kind of extremism? So um, I think it's important to, when you're doing comparative research to complement your quantitative data with context and qualitative data. And I think that's another thing that can be done in the future. Um, and then the final thing um, is that we need on the basis of all this work that is wonderful, we need more solution oriented studies, uh, studies to look at interventions and therapy and healing and to use that old uh, Tony Blair or Tony Blair spin doctor adage, you know, be tough on crime, be tough on the causes of crime, as in um, we academics and social scientists tend to stay in our comfort zone, which is to um, observe and try to, of course, explain and interpret why violence happens. Uh, it's, you know, trying to change anything about it. It's a lot. It's a lot messier. Uh, but it's 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 worth um, doing. I've got other things to say, but I'm going to stop here because uh, I'm leaving some questions. But thank you again for this book and thank you for the invite. Okay, I'm going to navigate both online and here, uh, and I'm going to stand here and hopefully uh, see how we move on. And thank you all for a great uh, uh, kind of presentation. And also, Stathis or Nicholas, if you want to uh, kind of uh, talk, give me uh, a wave or something, and I'll try uh, to give you uh, uh, room to be able to discuss as well. So do we have any questions? Yes, please. First of all, thanks very much to speakers and present ones and the absent ones as well. Um, two short questions. Um, the first one uh, was mentioned by Professor Kalimbas, I think, Professor Yuriyadu, um, is that there's also the, the form of non state violence and there's also the form of state violence, which is highly culminating in these days, I think, uh, about police brutality and it forms into an argument of 
um, you know, in equilibrium because there is non-state violence. Uh, that's why there is state violence as well, and the opposite, you know. Um, and my my understanding throughout the, the talks was that um, it's because these people who participated in uh, political violence and non-state political violence uh, throughout the previous decades, um, it's not that they just participate, but somehow at some point they formulate arguments um, about the state, about the function of the state, about the function of the institutions. And it seems, in my understanding again, that these arguments are adopted, are incorporated into major political parties in Greece, um, and somehow they tend to put pressure on the, um, on the government, on the uh, opposition, to incorporate these arguments about police brutality. So it seems that there is a sort of uh, dilemma to choose which violence is good and which is bad. And please elaborate on what extent um, the arguments on police brutality is a sort of answer to a non-political violence. And the second question, mostly mentioned by Professor Yerodinos, I think, and Professor Sebastakis as well, is that, um, uh, from what I, I try to work on these things, I understand that every time in the 20th century we have an economic crisis, the far right and the far right crisis appears to be culminating again. And every time we have in Spain, uh, in Italy, in Germany, um, a sort of political crisis, the far left violence and um, uh, politics, let's say, seems to emerge and culminate again. Is that correct? Is, is my understanding correct? Or uh, what What else you might wish to add, please, on that? Thank you very much in advance. If there are no other questions, I'd, I'd say let's give it a go. Uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, yeah I, I think if if Nicolas or Stavis wants to intervene, they can just... Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Yes, uh, the, the last uh, point, the last point, uh, the far right violence and the economic factor uh, and the far left violence and the political crisis, uh, as I understand the question, uh, it would take uh, a major economic and social crisis and the near bankruptcy uh, of the country to witness the emergence of a very dangerous dynamic on the far right and even a neo-Nazi far right, and not a far right uh, populist uh, uh, new right, but a, a, a near uh, neo-Nazi far right, uh, through the particular form of a political party covert criminal organization. Uh, in this case too, uh, uh, however, there were decisive action uh, on the part of the state and the judiciary, despite the delays and the initial underestimation uh, of the risk. That's my point, that the far-right uh, violence um, and activists has not tolerated in Greece. Um, on the contrary, uh, the far-left violence, the leftist violence in general, has uh, many uh, has a space of uh, of communication and moral acceptance. That's different. That's very different. And, and this is the legacy of the dictatorship and the legacy of uh, of uh, a, a one sided anti fascism uh, heritage uh, without an anti authoritarian uh, consciousness. And, uh, and sensitivity to the uh, political uh, the political sides of this far right, far uh, left extremism. Uh, that's my point. To the last point of view. But you Thank can you. Say that it has political roots somehow. The far left, while the far right seems to have economic roots. It's a root causes. Let's say. Would you say that? This is the question. Uh, that you need empirical data, and I know that it's not an easy thing to answer, you know, quickly. But um, is this your understanding as well? 
I think the I think the economic crisis um, um, affects more the uh, middle class uh, strata, uh, middle class strata that uh, the radicalization of middle class people and gaff or uh, follows mostly the nationalist rhetoric or the rhetoric uh, against the immigrant. It's uh, more uh, understandable this kind of radical path uh, without the agenda, uh, the ideological and uh, framework of left analysis of capitalism. The nationalism, uh, a narrow nationalist response is more easy as a solution for a, a in, in time of crisis, in time of economic and social uh, crisis, I think. That's my... Do you want to add something? Understand. Perfect. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, I... you, can, you can be heard from here, so that's fine. You don't need to move it a lot. <laughs> because everything is... Um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I agree. It is not so... In, in, in the real life, um, it, it, it is not so easy to differentiate between uh, state or institutional and non-state violence. Uh, we did this uh, because uh, our data set, our sources, our data sources uh, had specific limitations. Mm -hmm. um, in the sources, uh, we have chosen many media. Uh, oh. We have a dog in the room. <laughs> okay, keep going. <laughs> um, it was not possible to do both and to cover the entire spectrum of political violence. Um, in another project I have worked in, um, where we have focused only on the far-right violence, um, we found a lot of evidence of uh, uh, police um, um, violence that was triggered by the police officers uh, on duty as well as off duty. This was not the police as an institution, but what we found um, was incidents, incidents, violent incidents, mainly attacks against immigrants, or bad behavior against media, uh, immigrants committed by um, police officers during their duty or um, um, off duty. Um, another point that um, um, that is um, that we have to mention is that uh, um, state and non-state violence and the different aspects of violence are interrelated to each other. There is an interaction uh, between, um, for example, um, far right and far left perpetrators. Um, there is uh, very often an offensive uh, um, conflict between them that provokes violence as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is the result of this interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the real life <laughs> and in the society, um, it is not uh, so easy to differentiate, but we did, although we know uh, that uh, uh, this puts some limitations in uh, uh, our results and our understanding 
of, of violence. Concerning the, the reasons, um, what motivates violence, uh, I think it is, um, uh, we have more findings concerning what motivates a far uh, uh, right violence. In that case, we know that um, um, economic reasons, um, as well as cultural reasons, uh, play a role. In many cases, at the same time, both drivers, economic and cultural, are important and uh, uh, trigger and far-right violence, and not only far-right violence, uh, far-right support, support for the far-right parties, far-right organizations, movements, etc. as well. Okay, Tabrini, or do you want to add something? Um, well, regarding, the, as, as, as Pacifica said, just the second question, you know, regarding far-right violence, violence and what triggers them. Far-right violence is much more embedded in the context of the financial crisis, it's true. So economic grievances and cultural backlashes uh, trigger far-right violence. On the other hand, far-right violence did not respond to those uh, theories that we tested, so grievances, for instance, and political opportunities. And as political opportunities, we tested, for instance, the participation of an extremist part in Parliament, like Colton John, and uh, the fact that we had for the first time a radical left a coalition government composed by the far right and the, the radical right and the radical left. So far right is responsive to those political opportunities, whereas the far left is not. But on another, uh, let's say the second um, step of our uh, research that we uh, uh, conducted to facilitate the organizational components, which is much more quantitative, we saw that far left organized violence is much more about internal stimuli. So it's more around commemorations of uh, uh, far left, let's say, uh, important historical events. It is about solidarity to their um, uh, comrades that might be imprisoned, or it is about um, organizing initiatives of uh, fundraising, etc. So far left violence uh, in Greece is more related to um, historical legacies, as previous uh, speakers said, but also it is about its organizational dynamics. And uh, for this, December 2008 was very important because numerous organizations have spread out of this uh, experience of the riot of 2008. I was just oh, I was going to say that last and just add one thing, which is that far for the far right, and we we'll generalize it now. It's sort of the, it's it's the loss of uh, a world or a life as we knew it. But the beauty is insecurity about the future, which could be economic or cultural, migration, and so on. It's it's a threat to one's identity. Whereas for the far left, it is a trauma, as Lavinia was just claiming. Um, that is also about a lost past, um, but it's in a different way. So I, I would say that it's probably shared by their differences. It is kind of like a negative, a very negative discourse around the present and the future, and a sense of threat, a sense of being humiliated by somebody. But the source of humiliation is sometimes different. It could be the political slash economic establishment. But that, I think that, that's where sometimes they converge. One, one is much more about um, the far is much more about sort of macro, I would say, whereas uh, macro being um, uh, financial institutions and, and, and political elites, whereas, whereas the far right, of course, through populist discourse, can, can um, sort of weaponize it and use it, but it's also about um, what's happening in, in sort of a micro community. Um, it could be the immigration, could be changed to. Um, um, I mean, the one of the things that 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 can be that. So I wouldn't go in. I for me, this is not true economics and politics, but in these monuments things around the past and and threats to one's um, identity. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Yes, please. 
It's been quite interesting. And uh, since we all live here and we experience that, it, it, it's a wonderful procedure to put them in an order. For me, that is the most important issue tonight. Well, I have something that came to mind. It's uh, what is the connection between violence and education? I always consider that in order to achieve a better society, you had to 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 look forward to a, a to a, um, aristocracy of the spirit through education. Does that apply here? Is it <coughs> violence, political violence, or all kinds of violence that you explain related? to lack of education or affected in any way by education. Are you talking about both per perpetrators and society allowing it exactly. in a way? Okay, difficult question. Have you have that in your data sets? <laughs> you can say about it. Um, so to properly answer this kind of question, one needs individual level data and we don't have. So I cannot uh, have a, a data driven answer but uh, what's your feeling? Well, uh, I think that you know we all participate more or less in the same educational system, and uh, this does not uh, vary a lot. What I think is quite problematic is that a big proportion of this uh, uh, violence is initiated inside of universities. So in the connection between, uh, let's say, protest social movements and uh, um, uh, university spaces. So education in that sense, I cannot say, as a, I understand that your question is about education as a value. Exactly. It's quite exactly. different. The exactly. only thing I can say which relates specific to our research is that all the, these spaces around the educational system they somehow uh, help those, uh, let's say, uh, violent uh, ideas to spread and organizationally also uh, for uh, violent actors to penetrate inside uh, the youth and uh, the youth uh, movements. So I haven't answered your question, I know, but that's how I could answer it. Maybe it's the next uh, project. It's very difficult because uh, you have to have individual level data from violent actors. The only type of data that we had, I don't want to monopolize time, is that when we have we've done some interviews with far left and far right actors, it's true that there is a big difference. Far left uh, um, interviewees were very well educated compared to far right ones. So we saw a big difference there. Uh, and most of the people that we have uh, um, interviewed in a, who were inside the far left violent movement, they were all um, they all have masters and they were doing PhDs. So I don't know if this indirectly answers your question. Although yeah. If I might to add yeah, please. We are running a bit of time, but I think it's important thing and important that element to cover. This. Uh, qualitative data, um, give an overview that is not uh, a representative one. So um, there are only some signs, uh, but we cannot generalize because we don't have individual data from a representative study that uh, give us the opportunity <coughs> to make a generalization and to answer to your question. I guess this is the same for education as value, but also educational settings and institutions as cultivating radicalization of different types. Uh, Romano, you wanted to add something? Yeah, it's actually an interesting question. Uh, I was like, how's it is a lot of data either? Um, you know, if you look, if you look at education, in, of course, in this socioeconomic kind of like level of like educational pain, which has left with simply class connotations, I don't think there is a pain particular. Uh, in terms of, uh, and then if you think of education in terms of institutional education, or the quality education in Greece, I mean, you could argue that we had a very excellent quality education for those who could be educated in the 60s and 70s and so on, but that didn't stop us having 
or the violence, although you could say with you could say that a relative improvement of um, or stability of the 1990s, for example, could potentially be attributed to a cumulative effect of post 1970s um, of society of, you know, being mass educated and, 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 and arriving at the point where a lot of people uh, were going to this in that way. But I don't think we can, we can isolate it in that sense to have that positive relationship. But I agree with you about education and the balance education is a, a known. Um, Means of, of, of addressing that, you know, maybe coupled with, with other tools like um, with sort of coming in contact with people who you, you know, you may, may be part of the recruiter system or, or being more extrovert. Um, but it does empower people, it allows them to become much more aware of their emotional states and to, um, to not enter that, that cycle. So I agree with you in that case. Can I add something? Yes, please. Uh, we, we can see differences even uh, in far left violence, for example, from the far left terrorist organizations in the 70s. In Italy, uh, Ricardo Rossi had it from students, but also workers. But uh, the terrorists from Bader Meinhof were mainly from the middle class and well educated. Or in Greece, uh, November 17, uh, mainly workers. Or in uh, religiously motivated terrorists, uh, many had uh, PhDs and they will to make uh, terrorist uh, acts. I'm sorry, can so I? Can I can no, just we're just running a little a bit of time. I have. No, no, I understand, but there's another question we'll talk about in drink reception and like the uh, people on Zoom that cannot uh, join us. Last, last thing, please. That's the problem with previous discussion. Like, like every historian would probably say, Auschwitz was perpetrated by people with very high education. But for the questions, one to Roman knows, how do you navigate, how do you solve the problem of speaking about collective emotions, given that usually when we speak about emotions, it's about individuals? So, how do you go from the one level to the next? And to Stanis Kalimas, if you can uh, hear us. I think he has left. Yes, I'm sorry for running out of time. Okay, that's the last question. And I, the only thing I want to add so we can wrap it up, I was surprised that none of the speakers actually talked about this kind of, are we are this all this literature and data testifying to this Greek exceptional thesis? I mean, in history, we're trying to set off the Greek exceptional. We put it in comparative sphere and we realize we're not alone, actually. We serve many commonalities. Is this the case if you say in the longitudinal data from 1974 to today? Should we take a step back and think about that this is really not uh, the persistence or the intensity is not exceptional? And uh, that goes with the collective motion. That would be the last thing. I would do apologize for running late. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I really would, yeah. and, and to kind of correct that support at the same time, we should compare. Violence, violence, of course, you can see what happens there. But to answer your question, uh, you, you could, there is two ways you can approach this. One way would be uh, the micro level of, of our emotional states. These are not, again, we're not vessels. You know, we are the way, you know, there the whole of uh, field of functional anthropology, for example, would say the way we're brought up or the value systems or the family, the family would um, facilitate or cultivate particular ways of reading the world and not to mention about um, mental health and patterns of. Country, but then in terms of like taking this scaling example macro, uh, I, I just personally think it's legitimate to talk about with, with lots of caveats and so on and so forth about collective emotions and and to at least in the, in the context of academic research try to treat uh, political cultures and cultures as a positive unit of analysis because I mean you know unless you unless you do it, there's only you know individuals and families mm -hmm. that. As paraphrase the first prime minister, uh, there are also societies which have interesting traits that are not unique but different to each other. So, yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. Last, last point, or are you? To your question. Yes. Um, about uh, the um, alleged uh, exceptional ways. So it is alleged. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. Um, in a way, it is alleged. Um, actually, uh, in many other uh, 
uh, European countries, but not only in Europe, mm. uh, in the States as well, in Latin America as well. Um, there is a lot of uh, violent actions um, in, uh, in, in many um, in many sections, or in many spheres of society. Uh, there is uh, a kind of uh, violation uh, that um, in, uh, in, in Europe, in South Europe, took place uh, during uh, the economic crisis. And I think uh, all this, uh, uh, all this crisis that um, um, one after the other um, produces a lot of resentments and recent demands and feelings um, that are, um, let's say, a, a, a fundament, uh, a, a base for, for the rise of violence, for preparation of violent actions. So, um, but there is perhaps a sign of a Greek uh, exceptionalism um, a, a paper, the comparative paper uh, yeah. that is included in, in, in this section, um, both authors, they came to the conclusion that uh, severe uh, political violence in Greece is much more high than in many other more than 10 European countries. And I think this is a kind of exception <laughs> okay, perfect. We have to wrap it up. Apologies to the people on Zoom. It failed us completely. You, co you could not uh, write in the chat uh, box and you were waving hands. Uh, we feel totally apologetic. Uh, I don't know what happened. We'll fix it next time for sure. So we're